think that's it. Good evening, everyone. It's, fun. <laughs> it's wonderful to share with you. And, you know, just to be in the presence of God, it's, it's exciting and it's precious, isn't it? So wonderful to be able to share with you. David's going to be coming and ministering in a minute. Um, a Bible reading I'm going to just read from the Word of God, John 11. And starting at verse 17, and just while you're finding that, just to say that, you know, just how nice it is, and David will be sharing just a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we're involved in. But one thing that's, that um, what we are involved in, we're involved in a number of things, but one of them is something called Love Wales. And um, it's working with uh, teams, and with Mara and Harry in particular, um, reaching out across Wales sharing the gospel, to see the re-evangelization of our nation once again. So we work with lots of different organizations, ministries, churches, church leaders, you know, across Wales. And, you know, please pray for us. And, you know, we remember you and we're, you know, we just love the, the fact that this is called a revival center. <laughs> because we know how hungry you are for the presence of God. Let's see God to move in this land again. And I noticed that you've got a wonderful meeting next week on, on, on Israel. Well, if you're really excited after that and see it finishes at lunchtime, we've got a meeting in Swansea in the evening. Um, it's a, a celebration event, it's a graduation for a number of people in our, our school of ministry. So if you'd like to come along, it starts at six o'clock. From five o'clock onwards, we, we open up the doors and we, have, um, we, we invite organizations because uh, you know, we, we, we want to share, we want to, you know, it's not just one organization, one church, you know, it's, it's a case of, of, you know, involving as many people and working across as many organizations as possible. So from five o'clock onwards, uh, the doors open and we have various um, organizations, ministries who come, they bring their information so that they can share, they can share tell people you know what they are doing what is happening and it gives a lovely broad perspective perspective actually of just some of the things that are happening across Wales so if you can come along if you'd like to come along you'd be more than welcome lovely to see you just along the M4 it's in the Swansea City Church in in, in Swansea okay so that's a Love Wales event and uh, there's information on our website or please message us if you want for, for any details so if you've got the, your Bibles open now on John 11 and this starting at verse 17 and it's talking about Lazarus on his arrival Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother when Martha heard that Jesus was coming she went out to meet him but Mary stayed at home Lord Martha said to Jesus if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. But after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could, he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus once more was deeply moved and came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, 
Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. Yeah. Yes. There we are. Hear me now? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be with you tonight. And I know you're a church who really loves the presence of God. And you love to pray. I know I'm learning more and more as we uh, take students down at the Bible College through 12 weeks of sometimes what is just wonderful transformation experience in their lives. There are often like four phases that happen in a in a gathering or in a time, a season when people are seeking God. First of all, there is information that's imparted and that almost happens every time you hear somebody speak. There's an information connection taking place. Information is good, but you know that revelation is better than information. A revelation can come out of information, but information will inform you, but revelation will just touch something in your spirit that you say, wow, now I really see, I understand. It's like not just knowledge. You're starting to have encounter. Amen. But then after revelation, when revelation goes forth, don't stop at revelation. That's a mistake sometimes we can make. You say, wow, God, that was amazing. Because there's something more God wants to do. There's always more God wants to give you. After revelation, it can come impartation. And as the revelation comes forth from God, they say, wow, God shows you something about him, something about yourself, something about the circumstances. Don't just say, wow, that's great. God doesn't show it to you just for you to say, that's amazing. He shows it to you so he can take you deeper. And then if you respond to him and really begin to seek him over the revelation that he gives you, you begin to respond and, have, and receive impartation. An impartation is where God really begins to touch us. Not just talk to us, but touch us very deeply. But don't just stop at impartation. Impartation is good. But there's something even better than impartation when God is moving. And that is transformation. Yes. And when you begin to be open to impartation and begin to receive impartation, that's the moment that, that, that you're never quite the same again. There's a transformation experience that takes place. I mean, in, and, and you know what? In, even within just a short time, God can turn things inside out, upside down, the right way round. <laughs> so what I'm saying is this. Thank God for the information, the revelation, the impartation, the transformation. And the goal of all the transformation is, is what is that? Is that we become more like Jesus. <laughs> now, this is my second term at the college. And uh, we've got a new group of students that just started two weeks ago. And they come from 10 different nations. We got students there from 18 to 68. Age is never an issue in the kingdom of God. It's not about your age. It's about your heart and about your attitude. Amen. Okay? Amen. I mean, last term we had someone who was 68 and they've just gone back to Cambodia to continue their work as missionaries working with the street children and those who are caught up in the sex industry and the sex slave trade and they've just gone back to Cambodia as well as 71. And we have a good friend, Marilyn Harry. Some of you know Marilyn. Okay? Five years ago, God spoke to her at a conference. It was a prophetic word given to her to go back to Wales. She was in Switzerland at the time. And God has given you a new season, a new work to do. She's been an evangelist for about over 30 years. And what God is saying to you, two, two things. Number one, do what I put upon your heart and stop saying you're too old. 
Huh? Don't say you're too old and don't say you're just a woman. Go back and do what I'm telling you. That's how Love Wales started. She, and she's got this lovely little saying as, as Marilyn, if you know her, you can probably hear her saying this. She says, she says, I like watching a lot of the old antiques programs. And she says, one of the things I've discovered is the older you are, the more you're worth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little, some literature that I just want to put there for you that's about the college. It's like just some of the books if you want to overlook at them afterwards. One of the things students get really conscious of is that even, even though it's not an academic course, because we're associated with the International Colleges Association worldwide, there are some things that are graded and marked and there are book reviews and course reflections and some of them haven't done any, any academic study for over 40 years. So I say, look, we have no failures. The worst we have is a hiccup and a try again, okay? But there is, no, there is no failure. But they get very conscious of their grades, especially some of the younger ones. Not so much the old ones, but some of the younger ones. And we've got the first assignment coming in this week, and some of them are already asking me, what did I get? How did I do? You know, did I get an A? Did I get a B? As you're going to find out next week. And so they'll find out tomorrow. But before I, they have their papers back, I always like to, at the start of the term, read them a letter. And it's a letter that was sent by a student studying to her mum and dad. And this is what she says. She says, dear mum and dad, since I left home for college, I have been remiss in writing and I am sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. I will now bring you up to date with what's been happening to me. Please sit down. Okay. Are you sitting down? Do not read on unless you are. I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and concussion that I suffered after jumping out of my dormitory window when the room caught fire is pretty well healed. I only get those bad headaches about once a day now. Fortunately, the fire and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the petrol station. He ran over, took me to hospital, began to visit me there. When I got out of hospital, I had nowhere to live because my flat was burnt out. So he asked me to go and share his basement apartment. And he's well, sort of small but cute. He's a very fine boy. We fell deeply in love and don't get upset. We got married six weeks ago. <laughs> There's even more great news. I'm pregnant and the hospital said it's triplets. And I know how much you're looking forward to being grandparents. The reason that we haven't visited is that my husband has been arrested. He's been sent to jail for something that they said was fraud, but I know that when he gets out, you will welcome him into our family with open arms. In conclusion, now that I've brought you up to date, I want you to know that there was no dormitory fire. I did not have concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in hospital. I am not married or pregnant. However, I just failed my history and science exams. <laughs> and I wanted you to see that in a proper perspective. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, getting the most out of life and living life to the full is it, learning to see with the right perspective. There's a, an old Arab proverb that says, I complained I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Yeah. And there is something whereby when you get life into perspective, you begin to get your priorities right, you get your focus right, and we stop complaining about some of the things we don't have, and we start being more thankful for some of the things we do have. We stop being jealous and envious of what we ain't got. To, and we start to be grateful to God for what we have got. And do you know something? When we start to be grateful for what we have, you find God will begin to trust you with more. Amen. And to give you more. Now the passage that John read tonight, is a passage about getting things into perspective. And, and the perspective I want to bring to you is simply this. That no matter how bad things get, Jesus always has the final word. No matter how much the grief or the sorrow or the circumstances or the difficulties, uh, you can't get much worse than someone in a tomb for four days. And all hope seems to be gone. 
But when you have a perspective that God will always have the final say, no matter what the circumstances, life begins to take on a different focus and a different meaning. And the story of Martha and Mary with Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus is is one of the most well-known in the Bible. It's a really famous incident, and it's incredibly dramatic and dynamic. And when you realize just how powerful it is about someone who's been dead four days being called back to life, one of the questions that I ask of it is, is this, and I have an inquirer in mind in, this, in these ways, is it, why is it only mentioned in John's Gospel? <laughs> and this is the final Gospel that was written last of all, and this is about 40 to 50 years later. I mean, if, this is such an amazing event. Why haven't we read about it before? Why, why didn't Mark or Matthew or Luke tell us about it? And, and some, you know, people will look at it and they try to argue and say, oh, well, it's only a parable because it didn't really happen. And now John, at the end of his life, is just put, painting a beautiful story about something that would have been lovely if it took place. Or, or it may be something that's descriptive of what will happen in the end, at the end of the age when God will raise everyone back to life. But it's, it's really just a nice story, but it, it wasn't something that really took place because they say if it did why didn't anybody mention it before and then you step back from that and you begin to realize something incredibly significant because John at the end of his gospel tells us something absolutely amazing he said now if everything that Jesus did was recorded all the miracles that he did, the signs, the wonders, where he went, what he said, in just these three and a half years. It must have been an incredible time. He said, if everything was done and recorded, down and recorded, he said, not all of the libraries of the world would be able to contain the books of the things that could be written about him. And so we only have glimpses into what Jesus did as the Holy Spirit moved people to record and to give what was necessary for a purpose to those who were being spoken to. It's one of the reasons that you can say, wow, God, you inspired this. If this was just a a man-made-up thing, I mean, the story of Lazarus would be all over the place all the time, but it's just the Holy Spirit held it back. And he held other things back. There's no, there's no account in, in Mark or Matthew of the widow of Nain's son who got raised from the dead, a young boy that Jesus called back to life. The men were moved by the Spirit of God to say that which was necessary at the time to those who they were saying it. And there's another reason as well, because at the end of this story, passage we didn't read, but if you read it on to the end of the chapter, you discover that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the authorities were so mad with Jesus, and they were also incredibly mad now with Lazarus, because many were coming to believe in Jesus because they saw Lazarus was alive. Lazarus himself now had a price on his head, and he was a wanted man. Now his life was in danger. Mary and Martha and the family would have been in danger. So I think it's incredibly compassionate of God that the other gospel writers just left them in the background until 40 odd years later, probably now when they had Lazarus had died again and finally gone home, that John tells the story because there's no danger to them anymore as a family. But whatever the reasons of it are, this is one of the most amazing accounts of God's love and God's power we read in the Gospels. And it starts with a family who were were desperate, a home where Jesus had visited many times in Bethany, just two miles outside Jerusalem, great place to stay. Whenever you're passing Jesus, you disciples always welcome. And now Lazarus falls sick. And they don't send for Jesus straight away, I don't think. Because it seems that when they send for Jesus, Lazarus seems to have got worse. Because when you read the timeline in the text, Lazarus was probably dead before even the messengers had arrived. And they knew it was a dangerous thing for Jesus to come back to Bethany and near Jerusalem because a few months before, the Jews had tried to stone him and kill him. So they don't want to put Jesus into a dangerous position. So they must have wavered and discussed, shall we send for him, shall we ask him, is Lazarus getting better, is he getting worse than when there was no sign of any improvement out of desperation towards the end. They say, yes, we've got to get Jesus here. 
And so the messengers come, and when they come, they say, Lazarus, your friend, the person that you deeply love, he is seriously ill. And something strange is, is revealed to us there when in, in the story, that when Jesus heard this, it says he waited two more days before he went to Bethany, which was another two-day journey. And the reason Jesus did that is, one, because I'm sure now he knew, probably Lazarus had already gone. Two days, he waited extra, two days journey. When Jesus finally arrives, he's told he's been dead. How many days? Four. So even if he had gone straight away, he couldn't have got there in time. And he knows Lazarus is dead because he goes on and he talks to the disciples and he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they said, oh, if he sleeps, he's going to get better. He says, no, you don't understand. He says, Lazarus is dead. And so Jesus knew this. So, and he delayed an extra two days before he started traveling. And the reason we, he does this and we are told later is simply this. He says, I'm glad that this has happened this way. So that when God finally intervenes and you see what God can do, he says, it will be for the glory of God and you will see something that you will have never ever seen before. And I'll come to that in a moment because they'd already seen some people raised from the dead. So what was going to be different about this? And so finally after two days, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, come on, we go, we go, in, we go into Bethany. And now they are alarmed. They're scared. They said, really? Remember what happened the last time you were there? It's dangerous, Lord. Really dangerous. Now, only three months to go to the cross. Everything was heating up. And Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? And when you walk within the light, you live within that light. And there are 12 hours of darkness where no man can work, but there are 12 hours of light where I've come to do my work. What is he saying to them? He is saying this to them, that in that 12 hours of light, he is saying, in the time that God has given for me, in my Father's will, I do not have to be frightened of what others may try and say or do to me. He says, there are 12 hours, and as I walk in the light, this is the condition, as I walk in the light of being submissive to what my father wants, there'd already been four assassination attempts on his life. There was going to be a fifth one when he would go to the cross. But all the other assassination times, afterwards Jesus would say, my time is not yet, my time is not yet, my time is not yet. And as he walked within the light of his father's purpose, he could say, I'm not frightened what may happen or what they may try to do to me because no one can take me before my time that my Father has set for me. There's a psalm, Psalm 139. It's an amazing psalm. One of my favorite psalms it is. Where David in that psalm, he, he, he talks about how God he formed him even within his own mother's womb. But then he says something quite amazing. He says, and all my days that I was to live, every one of them were written down in your book before one of them came to be. Every one of my days were written in your book. And Jesus, as if he has taken that, he says, I'm not frightened of what they will do to me. Because as I walk in the light of my Father's purpose, I will not go before my time. It, it, it's a theme that some of the great missionaries took up. Because they went into some of the most dangerous, difficult places on earth. It seems to have been started with someone, you know, that you may have heard the name, John Calvin, great reformer in Geneva, when he constantly faced danger at times. And, and he said on one occasion, he says, as I live surrendered to God's perfect will for my life and seek to walk in the light of what he has called me to do, he said, I am immortal until my work is finished. See, the stipulation is that you walk in the light and surrender to what God wants you to do. That's the stipulation. David Livingstone, he took up the same theme. He said, aren't you ever frightened in Africa with all the dangers and all the terrors and the disease and the sickness? And Livingstone, he expressed the same thing. And he said, he said, I am immortal until my work is finished. 
as I walk in the light of what God has called me to do. And Jesus is saying, I'm not frightened of what the world or what anyone else or what the devil may try and do as I walk in my Father's will and purpose. And Thomas, when he hears this, now Thomas gets a bad press. It tells us in the text, actually, that uh, he, was, he was called Didymus, meaning twin. Oh. Now, if you were called Didymus, I think you'd prefer to be called Thomas, okay? And Thomas, now, you see, he, he's not a coward, is Thomas. And when he has his problems later, doubting Jesus and the doubting Thomas, it's not because he is someone who is a you know, running scared and who doesn't want to believe. The problem he had later is he was so confused by everything that happened. But now that Jesus is going back to Bethany and he would be in danger and they would be in danger, Thomas is the one who says, come on, let's go with him. Yes. Even if we die, come on, we go together. And so they make their way two days towards Bethany. When they arrive, Martha is the first one to come out to see Jesus. And Jesus arrives whereby there's so much mourning and so much grief. And the house is full of sadness. Lazarus is dead. He's already been buried. He's put in the tomb. And Martha comes out to him. And Martha's got lots of questions. You know, it's when people are hurting and people are grieving, you know, sometimes... You have those whose mind is in a turmoil. Why, why, if, if, only, only. And there's others like, like Mary will come to in a moment. And it's not so much your mind that's in turmoil, but your heart is broken. And Jesus deals with them, the two sisters differently. And to Martha with all her questions, he, he, he answers the questions. What with Mary whose heart is breaking, he doesn't ask her or engage in any much conversation. He just simply says, show me where you've laid him. But to Martha, now Martha comes and she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And, 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 what, and what she is doing there, she said, God, if only you'd been at the time that he was more sick, you could have raised him up, you could have healed him, you could have done to others. You've even raised some people from the dead, but now he's in the tomb. It's been all these days. If only he'd been here before, even if you'd only been here a day later, maybe you could have raised him while he was still in the house. And she was saying, oh, I'm thinking God's power is something that's connected to the past. If only you had been here. Now, and Jesus says, he will rise again. And then she said, yes, I know that one day he will rise in the great resurrection when everybody will be raised. And now at this moment, she was transferring from the past to the future. I know one day we'll see God's power in the future. And it will be absolutely amazing when he will rise again. And into this, Jesus says, Mary, Martha, he says, the resurrection power of God is not in the past it's not in the future he said it is in me and now he says something that just thunders through the ages no other religious leader or person has ever ever said anything quite like this and he says to her i am the resurrection and the life and he who believes in me will never die and even if he dies you will live again. And at this moment, Martha caught a revelation. Peter is the first man to catch it. Martha is the first woman to catch it. She says, I know you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah who's come into the world. It's just an amazing moment. Now, you know, we as Christians, we can fall into the same trap as, as Martha if we're not careful. Sometimes they go, oh, if only I'd lived in the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> or if only I'd been in the revivals of the past. <laughs> or if only you'd been in church, you know, 10 years ago we had a move of God and it was so wonderful. And we think that everything God does is like, oh, the past was wonderful. And then there are other times where Christians say, oh, it'd be wonderful when we get to heaven. <laughs> Oh, it'd be just wonderful there when we were with Jesus. Oh, when we, when we live in the millennium and there will be, Jesus will reign upon the earth. Oh, it'd just be so marvelous then. 
and we go from the past to the future. Listen to me. The power of God isn't about past or about future. It's where Jesus is. It's where Jesus is. It's in him. And he is the source of life. And he says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And then Mary comes. Now, Mary falls at his feet. Every time you read about Mary in the gospel, she's always at the feet of Jesus. Every time you read about her, she's at the feet of Jesus, okay? And she said, oh, if only you had been here. Your heart is breaking. Martha's mind is spinning. Mary's heart is breaking. And Jesus just says to Mary, you know when your heart is breaking, you don't want long conversations, you don't want lots of theology. <laughs> you don't want to get into any great detailed discussions. <laughs> when your heart is breaking, you just want the presence of God. And if God was to answer your questions even when your heart is breaking, you just ask another question because it's an emotional pain that you're going through and a logical answer will never satisfactorily answer an emotional need. It has to be a, an, a revelation of something greater, which is the love of God. And so they bring him to the tomb of Lazarus. Communal tomb, probably built into the stone, cliff or cave nearby. And Jesus comes. And now you're going to see why he waited four days before this moment was to happen. Because he was going to do something that no one had ever seen before. And as he comes to the place where Lazarus is laid, you see something of his emotion. And I'm going to say something that would perhaps shock you. Because the first emotion that the scripture tells us that Jesus showed was anger. It says he was deeply moved. The, the Greek word literally means he shuddered. Or even more literally, it's he snorted like a horse. When a horse rises up in anger or in fury, and it's, a, it's the same word that's used when Jesus cast a demon out of a man who was possessed by an evil spirit. And he was angry at the demonic power that had taken hold of and ruined this man's life. And it says Jesus was deeply moved. He, 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 he shuddered. He was angry. And the reason he was angry, um, surrounded by all this pain and suffering and sorrow, was simply this. It was never meant to be like this. God never intended one foot, square foot of his good earth ever to be used as a cemetery. It was never meant to be like this. God never intended it like this. God never intended for any of the suffering or death or grief or tragedy that has come upon the earth. And when God looks down at these things and he sees what sin has done and he sees what death has done and he sees what the devil has done, he gets angry. He gets angry. And Jesus, as he stands before the tomb, he's angry at what death has done to this family. Now one day he will wipe away all tears, the Bible says. One day there'll be no more death, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more tears. But now, in the midst of this moment, he exhibits that other very deep emotion. And we have the shortest verse in the Bible that you may well know. It simply says, Jesus wept. And he begins to sob. He wept. Not just a few tears, he wept as he stands before the tomb. Now, questions that have been asked, why did Jesus weep? Why do you think Jesus wept? And some answer the question, and they say, well, what's he weeping for? Well, some say he's weeping in sympathy for Mary and for Martha and the family. Others say, well, maybe that is the case, but they think he's weeping more in sympathy for himself. <laughs> in a few months' time, 
This is going to be his situation, his state. He knows what is to come. He knows what is before him with the cross. But let me suggest another alternative to you. Maybe he's simply weeping for Lazarus. <laughs> Maybe someone said he is weeping because he knows in a few moments he's going to bring him back. And he's going to take him from where he is. <laughs> and Lazarus is going to have to live and die again. And when he's going to live, he too is going to have a price upon his head. And he's going to have to come back into this world with all its pains and all its heartaches and all its sorrows. Or maybe he's just weeping because again he sees what death has done to this world and his heart is broken. A very famous evangelist by the name of Smith Wigglesworth documented 13 people documented he raised from the dead one of them was his own wife mary jane he called her polly she died i think he was around 50 years of age she was a similar age and he came in from work one day he was a plumber by profession and polly had died and she'd been laid upstairs and she goes up to the room where she is and as she's there lying on the bed, Smith calls her back. He rebukes the spirit of death and he calls her back. You see, he had gained some authority in prayer. And once you've gained a position, once you've gained a position, once you've gained a position, you can do it again and again and again and again. And he calls her back. And Polly comes back and Smith, he records what happened and we have no reason to doubt with the integrity of the man. He had no reason to make this up or to try to promote himself. He had done enough other things to try and impress us with this. But he tells us what happened in that moment. He called her back and Polly turns to him and says, Smith, what are you doing? He says, my work is finished. My time has come. And Smith says to her, but I can't live without you. I need you so much. And she says, Smith, you've got to let me go. You've got to let me go. Because Jesus is calling me and my time is finished. And Smith said, okay. And he said it was one of the hardest things he ever had to do. Basically what Polly was saying is, I don't, as much as I love you, Smith, I don't want to come back <laughs> Uh -huh. I don't want to come back. And Jesus, he stands before the tomb and he's going to call Lazarus back. And now you understand what he meant when he said, this has happened so that you might see the glory of God. Because it's going to show that Jesus doesn't just have authority over disease. He had to heal the disease that kills Lazarus, otherwise he'd come back sick with it and die very quickly again. He doesn't just have authority over death. He had shown that before. But now he shows he has authority over something else. Not just death, but decay. They said, Lord, it's been four days. And his body's stinking. And, 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 and even today out in the Middle East, within 24 hours, 48 hours at the most, the body has to be buried. It has to be embalmed it has to be dealt with because of the heat and the mortification and the decay it happens so quickly and and after four days he, he said roll away the tomb and he said what are you asking roll away the stone he said what are you asking the body's stinking by now it's stinking you see he waits for these four days there was a tradition that ha that some of the jews believed and it became very popular in later writings it says that the soul would try to sometimes return to the body for up to three days. But up to the fourth day it gave up because the soul would see that the body had started to decay. And now after four days, Jesus is going to show that he doesn't just have authority over sickness and over death. He has authority over decay as well. Nobody ever seen this before. 
No one had ever seen this. You know, whenever I take a funeral service, or service in a crematorium, and I must have said these words so many times over the last 35 years. I remember saying them over the graveside of my own father, and he put the body into the grave, and death goes into the ground, and it's covered, going to be covered over in a few moments, and just left there. And you throw in the earth, it's dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. No, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to take time, but that's what's going to happen to the body. Or in the crematorium, we say, therefore, we commit these, this body to the elements. And it's going to come out in just ashes. And every time I, I, I say those words, whether at a graveside or in a crematorium, I think, Lord, one day you said, all the decay, all the disintegration, one day, you're going to call it all back. You're going to call it all back. And that which is sown in corruption is going to be raised incorruptible. Says that which is sown perishable is going to be raised imperishable. And then we will say, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? When death has finally been swallowed up, it says, in victory. That is the moment when at the end of it, Jesus is going to call it all the decay, all the decomposition, all the disintegration, and Jesus is going to call it back. And now we have a glimpse of this because for the first time ever, after four days, someone we see as authority, not just over death, but over the decay of death. And Jesus shouts out in a loud voice and he says, Lazarus! Communal tombs in those days. Many bodies in one tomb perhaps. Somebody said if he didn't shout Lazarus, maybe they would have all come. <laughs> okay. He says, Lazarus, come forth. They've removed the stone. He said, remove the stone. And now you see this figure coming out. And people can hardly believe their eyes. It must be such a breathtaking moment. And he comes out and he's shuffling, maybe hopping, jumping, struggling. He's been wrapped up with grave clothes. He's been embalmed with some spices. His head is covered with kind of an handkerchief over him. And he comes out shuffling. And everybody is just looking at absolutely overwhelmed and amazed. <laughs> and then Jesus says something. Something quite, quite beautiful, but quite profound. He says, take off the grave cloth. Take off the grave cloth. And let him go home. Take off the grave cloth. And the word I want to just finish bringing to you tonight, and all the rest of the story is just to this moment. <laughs> it is one thing to have experienced and heard the voice of God calling you forth from the tomb. And many, maybe all of us here tonight, have heard that in our own spiritual experience. When we turn from death to life, we call it being born again. But you know, even in that moment when we get born again, many of us can still be so wrapped up with so many grave clothes. Everything in this world, everything in this universe is dying. All around us, death and decay we see. Everything in the universe is running down. Scientists, they tell us within five or maybe 10 billion years, the universe is going to implode back upon itself and there is going to be absolute emptiness once more. Scientists call everything running down the second law of thermodynamics. Everything is dying. Everything is in decay. Death comes to everyone. That's why everyone dies. That's why everything dies, ultimately. That's why everything we are and everything we love dies. Because this world is full of death. And there's death everywhere. And tomorrow morning we will walk into environments where there'll be lots of death. 
We walk through a world that is filled with death. Things have happened to us even before we became Christians and since we've been Christians where, where death has wrapped some grave clothes around us. And even though our spirit has come alive, our, our soul is still all wrapped up. In, in, in last year's course in, in the college, we had a, a young man, his name was Jeremiah, and uh, oh, he's a lovely young man. And he really loved God. And he said, Jeremiah, why do you come to college? He said, why are you here? And he said, Pastor, I've been a Christian for so many years, but I had such a bondage with pornography. And he says, one day I was rushed into hospital. They thought I had some serious disease. They thought I was dying. And there I was in hospital and I thought I was dying. I says, God, if you just get me out of this, he says, I will serve you all my life and I will do anything that's necessary to deal with the pornography. He says, they came back a few days later. They said, everything seems not so serious as we thought. You can go home now. He said, the first thing I did when I went home, he says, I burned all the pornographic books. I got rid of all the pornographic material. And he said, I began my journey to freedom. What was he doing? He was getting rid of some of the grave clothes. Some of, you see, until you get rid of the grave clothes, even though you've come out of the tomb, you're still going to be all wrapped up. You're not going to experience life as God intends you to know it. You're going to be covered over and you're going to be you're not going to be running you're not going to be soaring everywhere you go you're going to be hopping and shuffling and falling down and trying to get back up again there comes a moment whereby we have to determine in our hearts with god's help and sometimes we need other people's help that i don't have to live my life any longer wrapped up around my heart or my mind with any grave clothes the grave clothes of fear, the grave clothes of addiction, the grave clothes of the, what's happened to you, the pain of abuse, things that you've gone through, the grave clothes of torment and depression and anxiety. Now listen, the thing about grave clothes is this, there are many layers. You see, and this is where we sometimes make the mistake, there, there are, can be so many layers that you, that you have one touch or you have one experience, or you have one encounter, or you have one on your knees time with God, and you feel a bit better, and you think it's all gone. No, it may not all be gone, but I tell you what, you've got rid of another layer. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got rid of another layer, and if you get rid of another layer, and still find that you have battles, and there are issues and things that you're struggling with, what are you going to do? Come and get rid of another layer. And then get rid of another layer. And then get rid of another layer. And there'll come a moment when you're afraid, there's no more layers. No more layers. They're gone. And then you can start to walk properly and run properly and jump properly. You've got to get rid of the grave clothes. And even though it's Jesus who calls us to life, he said, you take the grave clothes off him. Help him. And I tell you, there came a point when they began to unwrap him. I would imagine that Lazarus began to get so excited that he began to pull him off himself. Now, some of us, when we have so many layers wrapped around us, we need someone to help us. We know it's always the Holy Spirit, but God has given us one another as well. But I tell you, when they start to come off, I guarantee you, and you begin to get free, you'll start to pull them off yourself as fast as you can. Get rid of the grave cloths. And so the word that I want to bring to you tonight as we close is this. It's time to get rid of the grave cloths and put on the wedding clothes. Amen. Put on the wedding clothes. It's time to get rid of all the mourning. It's time to get rid of all the death. And it's time to learn to dance again. Amen. It's time to learn to sing again. It's time for her to rejoice again. And yet, you may have lots of layers. Listen, it doesn't matter how many layers there are. It doesn't matter how much decay there has been. That when we come to Jesus, there is no power of disease, of death, or even decay that is greater than fears. And you say, oh, this may have been a long time. It doesn't matter. This may have gone very deep. 
doesn't matter. This may have gone and you may feel putrefied by it. It doesn't matter. He's Lord, not just of death. He's Lord of decay. And that's what this story is about. And Jesus said, you will see the glory of God. And do you know what the glory of God is? It's what I came back to, said at the very beginning. The glory of God is transformation. As we are being transformed, the Bible says, into the likeness of Jesus, from glory into glory by the Spirit of God. And so can I just encourage you tonight, whatever the grave clothes, however life may have wrapped you up badly, however people may have wrapped you around and bound you with things they've done or things that you've done to yourself, I tell you, when you hear Jesus call your name, and he does, he, he knows all our names, yeah. calls your name, and you say, yeah, I feel as if I've come out of the tomb, but, but, but why am I all so wrapped up? Just ask him to help you tonight. And every day, God help me to get rid of the grave cloths. And he will. Let's pray together. John tells us this is the final miracle that Jesus does in John's gospel. John records seven that he performed, and every one of them is called a sign. The miracle was simply something pointing to who Jesus is. And he begins his first miracle at a wedding, and now his last miracle here is at a funeral. And it's God's way of saying to us, he wants to be involved in every area of our lives. From weddings to funerals. When Jesus shows up, he makes all the difference. Could the musicians come back, please? We just want to take a few moments. And we just want to stand in the presence of God and just respond to his voice and see you, 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 you know where you struggle you know the issues you know the problems you know the battles you know the fears and the failures you know to say Lord tonight I've come out I've come out of the tomb, but now I want to come out of these grave clothes. I want to come out of the grave clothes. <coughs> Jesus. Jesus. It is for freedom that we have been set free. No longer to be subject to a yoke of slavery. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I have come, he said, that you might have life. In a world that's full of death, you know, the only thing that's living in this world, truly living, that will live forever, is that which is of the Spirit of God and that which is touched by the Spirit of God. Everything else is dying. Everything else is dying. Death all around. But in a world that's full of death, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life in all its fullness. Not just when we leave this earth, but now even in the midst of it, till he calls us home, or he comes again. How many of us tonight have got some grave clothes we need to get rid of? How many of us have got some grave clothes, eh? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't take great revelation knowledge for me to say that in any group of people, even in church, none of us are perfect yet, none of us have arrived yet. God hasn't finished with any of us yet. But you know, for some of us, there is a torment with them. For some of us, there is a something that we are just so wrapped up in this that it just gets us every time. And we love Jesus, but we can feel so bound. We can feel so condemned. We can feel impossible to be free. Listen, he is Lord over decay as well as death.
you know, one of the ways, this is why it's so beautiful, you know, when we come together in church and as we worship in His presence, even just worshiping in His presence as we respond to Him, the Holy Spirit comes and begins to unwrap some of the grave clothes. Yes. It happens in a worship time, it happens when we're on our knees in our prayer time, it happens when somebody comes around us and prays for us, it happens when we come before God and we are broken and ripped. I mean, there's so many ways in which God does this. And so what's important isn't the way. What's important is we get rid of all those rags. We get rid of all that stuff. And we just learn to get rid of the grave clothes and put on the wedding clothes. Put on the wedding clothes. Garments of righteousness. Robes of righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. There are no addictions. There are no bondages that are stronger than Jesus. However long we've had them. Some of us have grave clothes of of losing our temper. We have a real problem with anger. Get rid of the grave clothes. Some of us, the grave clothes of unforgiveness have wrapped so tight around our hearts. The Holy Spirit will help you to get rid of the grave clothes. Just get rid of those things. The Bible says we have to put off the old and put on the new. How many of us here tonight want to receive something from God? Put up your right hand. How many of us here tonight want to be blessed by God? Put up your left hand. Now how many of us here tonight that when we do receive from God and we are blessed by God, will go out this week to seek to be a blessing to others that freely received we may freely give. And if that is you, stand to your feet. We are here not just to receive tonight, we are here to be blessed, to be a blessing. Just lift up your hands. Lord, tonight, I speak freedom. And I say to the Johns and to the Peters and the Marys, to the Michaels, the Pauls, the James, and they hear you, Lord, say, come forth. And we say, Lord, we've come forth. But oh, we've got this stuff around us, Lord. Around our hearts, our minds, even our bodies, we feel it. But Lord, we give it to you tonight. We forgive. How do you get rid of those grave clothes of unforgiveness? You forgive. You simply say, Lord, I send this away. That's what forgiveness means. I send it away. I, Lord, I put them in. I put these people. I put what has happened into your hands. I send it away. Lord, what's been done to me? The pain of abuse. Lord, I send it away. I put it into your hands. Lord, the fear that I live under. The the guilt and condemnation. I send it away tonight, Lord. Lord, I declare to you tonight the power, all this incredible power in the blood of Jesus. Through the cross. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You come, Lord. Hallelujah. Come, Lord. I receive freedom tonight. I want to take off grave clothes and I'm going to put on wedding clothes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Come on. Just love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Some of us just feel this word. Let me give this one more. In the grave clothes of grief. Oh, the grave clothes. Of, I don't just mean just mourning. There is a time to grieve. But for some of us, it has not let us go. 
it has not let us go. And there is a season to grieve. But the Bible says, even though tears may come in the night, there will be joy in the morning. And I just want to just speak joy over your life. It's time now for the joy to come. It's time now for the joy to come. Some of you, you've grieved enough over what you've been like and what you've done. And God says he hears you and he loves you. It's time now to receive the joy. To receive the joy. Thank you, Lord. And we love you, Lord. Hallelujah. So let's just take a few moments. Let's just begin to thank the Lord for what he's just been doing in our lives. Who he is. And now this is what I say. And this is how I sing. Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be free. I want to be full of you. Lord, I want to be able to walk in a world full of death and be full of life. I want to walk in a world, Lord, where it's full of mourning and decay. And I want to be full of joy and full of your strength. Lord, in a world that's full of addiction and full of bondage, I'm going to be free. I'm going to be whole. Lord, in a world that's full of fear and despair, Lord, I'm going to be full of hope. I'm going to be full, Lord, of confidence and expectation. Because in you I can be free. Hallelujah. So just as we worship him, grave clothes are falling off.
Transformation begins to take place. Now tonight you've had some information. Some of you have received revelation. You began to receive some impartation uh, and, and some you know, transformation. So let's just come and just close as we just worship Him together. And I wonder if you could just lead us in a worship song. That would be great. was hope. It's time to hope again. It's time to hope again. The enemy's stolen your hope. And you, when, you, when your hope is gone, you begin to live in dread. It's time to hope again. It's God just release the power of hope here tonight. Release the power of hope to you. The Bible says that we might overflow with hope overflow with hope time to receive hope again for faith is the substance of things are hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen you need to speak to your own soul and you need to say to you so why are you downcast on my soul put your hope in god for i will yet praise him my god and my savior receive hope tonight God has not forgotten you. He has not finished with you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's worship Him together, shall we? As we close.
just give you opportunity before you be closed just to pray for you and over you. And if you just feel God is just leading you, just come and stand at the front right now. Come and stand at the front. Come and stand. I wasn't going to do this. But if you God to just come and stand at the front. And we're just going to just declare and shout freedom in this place. Freedom. Freedom.